neurotransmitters are probably the most powerful thing when it comes down to influencing how we feel at a certain time. To give you a good example of how a neurotransmitter can make you feel, if serotonin is high, you're gonna feel good, right? You're gonna be able to rest and relax. If epinephrine is high, that's what it feels like when you have coffee, right? Like, ah, oh, okay, I'm anxious, but I'm ready to go, right? Neurotransmitters are powerful, but it's not like we just take in a neurotransmitter. They are built by things. And there are foods that you can eat that will influence certain neurotransmitters. So today I have five neurotransmitters that can be heavily influenced by our food intake. So you can use this to kind of help manipulate a little bit of how you feel, sense of calm, sense of well-being, motivation. It's pretty neat when you actually look at how these neurotransmitters are built. So let's get into the very first one. I wanna talk about GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. It is my favorite neurotransmitter because as someone that's always been a little bit high strung, I've always appreciated GABA because it makes me feel kind of calm, right? And I've learned how to influence GABA over the years. GABA is what is called an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter, which means it blocks the excitatory transmission. In its receptors, a GABA receptor, both an alpha and a beta GABA receptor, are going to receive a signal and it's going to block the nerve's ability to transmit a signal. So it is literally inhibitory. If you had too much GABA, obviously you wouldn't even be able to function, right? But GABA is gonna sort of slow down some of the excitatory responses. So very big for someone like me. Like usually what people would do is they drink alcohol, increases GABA, right? But it can also create sort of a GABA uh, issue there as well. Obviously alcohol isn't a way to turn for this. So let's talk about some foods here. The first one is green tea. And it's mainly because of the theanine that is in green tea. What's interesting is that theanine can cross through the blood-brain barrier and then it can influence GABA directly within the brain. Now what this does is it creates more of a, an environment that has alpha waves. So you're in a more relaxed state while not actually being tired. So that's why green tea is interesting because you get this upper effect from a little bit of caffeine, but the theanine seems to counterbalance that by bringing up the levels of GABA in the brain. So your brain is a little bit calmer, even though your body might be able to move a little bit better with the caffeine. Secondly is one that people wouldn't think, and that's fermented foods. Fermented foods play a huge role in GABA production within the gut. Now, more research needs to be done on if GABA production in the gut is going to influence GABA in the brain as much. But we do know that it all kind of starts in the gut with glutamine, right? So glutamine is the building block of glutamate. And then glutamate gets broken down and converted into GABA. So a long story basically saying that Fermented foods, like fermented meat, maybe some kimchi, some sauerkraut, this can have an influence on GABA production in the gut. Specifically what it does is it increases the amount of GABA receptors in the gut, and it does this through the microbiome, which again, more research needs to be done, but it's really promising looking stuff. And the next thing is magnesium. Now I say simply magnesium because you could get it from almonds, you could get it from various kinds of food, but magnesium in general is really important for GABA. The reason is, is it increases what's called glutamate decarboxylase, which is what converts, remember that glutamate I talked about, converts glutamate into GABA. Without magnesium, glutamate would stay as glutamate, which is extremely excitatory. So you would have the opposite effect. So simply adding magnesium in allows you to take some of that glutamate and turn it into GABA. It's really fascinating stuff. Now, you can take GABA directly as a supplement. The problem is, is it seems as though it does not cross the blood-brain barrier properly. The only potential time in which it might cross the blood-brain barrier is if you have what's called a leaky brain, which we're not gonna go into detail there. There is a unique company named Troscriptions. I've had Dr. Scott Schur on this channel before, where they actually can take GABA and bind it to B3. So in this particular case, it's called nicotinyl GABA. So it's basically a niacin or B3 bound to a GABA, which allows it to get into the brain that way, which is really interesting. So then you have some broken down components of kava, not the direct kava lactones that we're looking at. We're looking at the other components of kava that are not going to have the downgrading or the sort of down regulation effect of GABA downstream because you could build a tolerance there. So you're getting a really calm feeling. 
Now, I put a link down below for a special discount through Toscriptions. So that link is in the top line of the description down below. Again, you've seen Dr. Scott Sher on my channel, very reputable organization with very legit science behind them and a huge medical advisory board that has some big names on it. And it's delivered in a trochee form. So you put it up in your gum, like up in the buccal space up there. And this way it can bypass sort of the degradation that would happen in the gut and it hits you really, really fast. When I get home in the evening and I'm kind of wired up and I need to come down, it is extremely effective. So when I take that before bed, it kind of dissolves that for me. So that link is down below, check them out. My next favorite neurotransmitter that we can actually influence a lot is acetylcholine. And it's probably one of the most important neurotransmitters for just daily function. Acetylcholine sits at the end of a nerve cell. And what happens is when you have an action potential that signals down a, you know, a nerve, a neuron, then it hits the synaptic cleft where acetylcholine sits. And acetylcholine's job is to kind of jump across the cleft to the next neuron. So it's taking that action potential and actually potentiating it, turning it into something. So without it, you wouldn't be able to function. You wouldn't be able to move, right? Well, there's two components to acetylcholine, right? The biggest component is choline itself. So the number one food that you could eat to influence acetylcholine is going to be eggs. Okay, eggs are super rich in choline. So you're contributing to that choline pool. You're deficient in choline, you're gonna notice it in your performance and your mental function. And since we have so many neurons in our brain, you'll definitely feel it there. Next up is fish because of the omega-3 aspect. And you could also take an omega-3 supplement, but this is interesting because it has nothing to do with the actual acetylcholine itself. For one, it can increase the activity of the acetylcholine, but more importantly, it increases the membrane fluidity, which means that a signal is able to be sent easier and get into that neuron easier. So it makes it more malleable and it makes it so that the acetylcholine can do its job better, not to mention reduces neuroinflammation, which can help acetylcholine do its job clearer and easier. It's not hitting a traffic jam. Then thirdly is an odd one, cruciferous vegetables, for two reasons. One, they have choline, okay, so that contributes to the choline pool, but also sulforaphane. Now sulforaphane is not only gonna activate the NRF2 pathway, which is gonna decrease oxidative stress and increase antioxidants, which allow acetylcholine to do their job better, it potentially inhibits what is called histone deacetylase. So you have this thing that's basically blocking epigenetic changes. When you inhibit histone deacetylase, what happens is now you can have epigenetic changes that allow you to use ACH or acetylcholine better. So long story short is it's influencing temporary and permanent genetic changes that allow you to be more efficient at using that neurotransmitter. All by eating cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, things like that. Then probably the most common neurotransmitter that people know of, serotonin, the feel-good neurotransmitter. We all like serotonin. Okay, when you look at even SSRIs, the whole idea is to slow down the reuptake so that serotonin stays high for longer periods of time and we feel good. But it's also a hormone in the body that helps your body feel calm, right? So the first and foremost, one that you've heard of before is turkey because of the tryptophan. Tryptophan is a precursor to serotonin. So plain and simple, you want large concentrations of tryptophan, eat good quality lean protein like turkey. Okay, that will help you. It does influence serotonin for sure. Next up is bananas. And I say this because bananas out of all the fruits are pretty high in tryptophan, but when you combine tryptophan with the carbohydrates, the insulin spike allows the tryptophan to go into the brain easier and it stops sort of some of the competition with the large neutral amino acids. So it allows basically the tryptophan to come in and the brain can take it up and then it can convert it into serotonin easier. And then lastly, for the same reason that we talked about with acetylcholine, omega-3s. So walnuts, fish, things like that, for the same exact reasons. Helps the signaling to be better. Okay, and let's talk about another one that Andrew Huberman has really made famous, and that's dopamine. That's our reward neurotransmitter. So when we've achieved something as simple as touching a doorknob, and it's what we set out to do, we feel it and we get a surge of dopamine. Scrolling our phone, eating food, same kind of thing. So how do we influence dopamine? It could actually help us with our motivation so we don't deplete it as much. Well, for one, avocados. Avocados are super high in tyrosine. Okay, tyrosine is an amino acid that is required for L-DOPA production. Okay, and L-DOPA is a precursor to dopamine. So essentially tyrosine turns into L-DOPA from something called tyrosine hydroxylase, an enzyme. Okay, and once it becomes L-DOPA, then it can become actual dopamine, okay? So you wanna provide yourself with tyrosine and tyrosine hydroxylase so you can convert this into the actual usable neurotransmitter. 
Same kind of thing with dark chocolate. Dark chocolate has epicatechin in it. And epicatechin can convert directly into dopamine. But at the same time that it converts into dopamine itself, it also drives down reactive oxygen species. It protects from oxidative stress at the same time. So epicatechin from dark chocolate and the flavonoids and the antioxidants in dark chocolate, really powerful for dopamine. But then in addition to that, you're also increasing blood flow and you're also increasing phenylethylamine, which is really, really good for dopamine production too. So dark chocolate, you feel it quick. You feel that dopamine hit, that's why it's addictive, but it's also a great way to just kind of get that fix without doing something more detrimental. And then we talk about beets. This is interesting. A, the nitric oxide, more blood flow to the brain, definitely a good thing. But we're talking mainly about betaine or trimethylglycine. Fascinating stuff here because Betaine acts as sort of a methyl donor. So there's this thing called methylation where you donate a methyl group to another molecule. So essentially what's happening here is this methyl group, this betaine, is breaking down homocysteine, which is not good, into methionine. And then methionine goes through another process to make S adenosyl methionine, also known as SAMe. If you've ever taken the supplement SAMe to help you feel better and increase your mood, that is exactly why. It can improve all these kind of feelings and make you feel like a little bit more alive. So beets have that powerful effect on just helping you feel more motivated. The last neurotransmitter I want to talk about is one that's no surprise to people. And that is good old epinephrine and norepinephrine. A couple quick ways to boost that. Caffeine. Epinephrine is a fat burning neurotransmitter. It is a go getting amp you up neurotransmitter. Okay. Caffeine is going to influence that by blocking the acts of adenosine and therefore contributing to this effect of, well, norepinephrine. But what people also don't realize is that lean meats like turkey, like chicken, these are gonna contain tyrosine, which yes, converts into L-dopa, like we talked about, but this is also critical for epinephrine production. Essentially, there's this thing called dopamine beta-hydroxylase, which is an enzyme that converts L-dopa also into epinephrine and you need tyrosine for that to occur. Tyrosine to L-dopa, L-dopa ultimately into epinephrine or norepinephrine. So the lower you are in your lean meats, the lower you are in your tyrosine, the less potential, well, I guess in a way you could say fat burning or at least epinephrine, norepinephrine you're gonna have. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. And remember, influencing your neurotransmitters starts with a lot more than just, I don't know, mindset and willing it into existence. I'll see you tomorrow.